Welcome, I'm Brian Cole and this is Introductory Logic, The Fundamentals of Thinking Well, a video course by Canon Press. First things first, we have to discuss the nature and purpose of logic before we can launch into lesson one. God created man with the ability to reason. God wants us to be able to reason so that we can communicate with him. God says in Isaiah 1.18, Come, let us reason together, says the Lord. Well, logic has to do with reasoning, and I want to explain how. Reasoning means drawing proper conclusions from other information. Reasoning means if you know this one thing is true, then therefore this other thing must be true. Logic has to do with that sort of thinking. In the scriptures it says that God has commanded all men everywhere to repent. Now this is a command that applies to everyone, obviously, because Paul says all men, but in order to apply it to individuals, we must use reasoning. All men must repent, we are men, therefore we must repent. Now, if someone denied the use of logic, they could deny the practical application of universal commands like this. Somebody could in fact say, well, I've never been commanded to repent. But if you say, the scriptures say all men everywhere must repent and you're a man, and they reply, Oh, well, you're using that logic against me, and I reject logic. A rejection of logic is a rejection of the application of universal statements like God commanded all men everywhere to repent. So, in summary, logic allows us to understand and properly apply God's revelation to ourselves. Now, formal logic is the science and art of reasoning well. Formal logic is the science and art that teaches us the standards of how to reason, how to draw conclusions from other information. So let's break it down. In what way is formal logic a science? Well, formal logic is a science because through analyzing or observing the mind as it reasons, we determine particular rules that we follow when we reason. As a science, we categorize those rules and name the parts of logic. That's similar to other sciences. We're analyzing something in nature and coming up with standards that people follow. For example, biology observes living organisms. Astronomy observes the stars in the heavens. Formal logic observes the mind as it reasons. And it comes up with standards that distinguish good reasoning from poor reasoning. And that's the primary thing that we are going to be working on in this course. So it's clear that logic is a science, but logic is also an art. It can be considered an art when we look at the practical application of those standards to particular types of reasoning. So if we want to apply the command that God has commanded all men everywhere to repent, or when we want to apply other arguments in creative ways, then we are treating logic as an art. When we argue, when we discuss, when we debate, in any way that we can communicate with one another, logic is an art. Augustine, in his book De Doctrina Christiana, on Christian doctrine says, and yet the validity of logical sequences is not a thing devised by men, but is observed and noted by them. The fact that logical sequences are observed and noted by humans demonstrates in what way logic is a science. We observe and we note things about the way men reason. Why do men observe and note it? Augustine says that they may be able to learn and teach it. Along with learning and teaching logic, we also apply it. And in that way, logic is also an art, for it exists eternally in the reason of things and has its origin with God, he says. The final point Augustine makes is that we didn't invent logic. Logic is a discovery of the way that God has made humans to reason. Logic is in fact a thing that comes from God himself. Now, all of logic is based upon three fundamental laws of thought. Now, all buildings have to be built upon foundations. It's the same with logic. In the case of logic, these foundation stones themselves are built on the character and nature of God. And we'll see that, hopefully, as we go through this course. First of all, is the law of the excluded middle. The law of the excluded middle says that any statement is either true or false. Take this statement, Jesus is Lord. As a statement, it's either true or it's not true. You hardly need me to say it, but this one is true. No matter who reads Jesus is Lord, he or she can either believe it or not. Those really are the only two options. Logic does not allow for a third way where something is neither true nor false, but some other option. Statements are either true or not true. Another point, 
Statements are not either true or false based upon what we know or who is reading them, but statements are either true or not true based upon what God knows. God knows all things. Given any statement, he knows whether it's true or false. Second is the law of identity, which says that if a statement is true, then it's true. Now this might be so obvious that you might question why I would be wasting time on it, but consider how some people think. If you're explaining the gospel to them, if you're talking about how Christ has died for your sins according to the scriptures and has been raised again from the dead, someone might say, well, that's true for you, but it's not true for me. We would argue, no, if a statement is true, then it's true. As a thought experiment, imagine if this wasn't the case. Imagine that if a statement was true, then maybe it's not true then no logic would even be possible. We wouldn't be able to reason if truth were as squishy and porous and goopy as all that. So the law of identity is one of those solid foundation stones that allows anybody to think at all. If a statement is true, then it's true. Third is the law of non-contradiction, which says a statement cannot be both true and false. You can't say, well, yes, yeah, sure, it's true that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, but it's also not true that he did that. That makes no sense, obviously. And again, we wouldn't be able to reason if we allowed ourselves to think that way. So the law of non-contradiction is the third and final of those foundation stones. So let's recap the three laws of thought. Any statement is either true or false is the law of excluded middle. If a statement is true, it's true is the law of identity, and a statement can't be both true and false is the law of non-contradiction. Next, I want to explain some of the structure of logic. Logic, as it's built upon these foundation stones, has a particular structure, and this structure will help us to preview where we're going to go in this introductory logic course. So get ready. First of all, logic can be broken up into two branches, informal logic and formal logic. And this distinction happens because of how we think about logic as connected to reasoning. Informal logic is logic that is indirectly related to reasoning. When we reason, we reason by means of logical arguments. Something like the example we looked at, God has commanded all men everywhere to repent. We are men, therefore we must repent. This is reasoning directly. But when we reason that way by means of arguments, we use statements. We are men is a statement. And so informal logic deals with knowing the truth value of statements. Now, statements themselves are made up of words or terms, men and repent and command, things like that. We need to understand terms, how we know the definition of terms and how we can relate terms to one another. Informal logic, that first branch deals with terms, defining terms, relating terms to one another, etc. It also deals with statements, how we know the truth value of statements and the truth value of one statement relative to another. I know that sounds like a foreign language, but don't worry, we'll get to it. The final thing informal logic deals with is informal fallacies, which are some of my favorite things to study. Informal fallacies are ways of reasoning that are not formal, and at least on the internet, are usually disastrous and to be avoided. In our tree of logic, with two big branches, the second big branch is formal logic. Formal logic is logic that deals directly with reasoning, which means it deals directly with the arguments by which we reason. There are two main branches of formal logic itself, deduction and induction, and this distinction has to do with the sort of reasoning that we use in formal logic. Inductive arguments are arguments of probability, arguments that are based upon observation or experience. When we have repeated experience with something and we draw a conclusion based upon that experience. When the conclusion is only probable, then it's inductive reasoning. So if I said, last spring dandelions grew in my lawn, the spring before that dandelions grew in my lawn. Therefore, next spring, I'm going to get more of the terrible fluffy yellow things in my lawn, probably. Well, that's inductive reasoning. It's based upon experience and it gives us probable conclusions. We don't know that weeds will continue to grow next year, but it's very probable if your parents have ever sent you out to work in the yard. Deductive arguments, on the other hand, argue from universal statements that are assumed to be true, called axioms, such as all men are mortal, 
Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. In deduction, the conclusions are not only probable, they're certain, depending on how certain the premises are. So if it is true that all men are mortal, and it is true that Socrates is a man, then it must be true that Socrates is mortal. No probably about it. And yep, Socrates is in fact dead already. The conclusion follows necessarily, not probably, from the premises. That's deductive reasoning. So in summary, induction is based upon experience, and the conclusions are only probable. Deduction is based upon axioms, and the conclusions either follow from the premises or they don't. Well, deduction itself can be broken up into two smaller branches, categorical logic and propositional logic. Categorical logic is the type of logic I've been talking about up till this point. All men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is immortal, is a classic categorical argument, what's called a categorical syllogism. In categorical logic, the basic unit of thought is the term or the category, all men are mortal connects the categories of men and mortals. Socrates is a man connects the categories of Socrates and men, and so on and so forth. When we work with categorical syllogisms like that, we're in the realm of categorical logic. And of course, you can talk about whatever you want, although who would ever get tired of talking about dead Greek wise guys? Propositional logic, on the other hand, uses the entire proposition or statements themselves as basic units of thought, and the conclusions connect one statement to another statement rather than simply connecting terms to each other. So an example of a propositional argument would be something like this. If I go to that popular organic coffee shop, I will buy a burn-tasting Americano. If I buy a burn-tasting Americano, I'm going to spend my hard-earned money I don't actually have any hard-earned money, so I shouldn't go to that coffee shop. Well, the basic units of thought there, I go to the coffee shop, I spend my hard-earned money, those are whole propositions. Propositional logic deals with arguments like that, where we're connecting propositions to other propositions with logical operators like if, then, uh, and, or, so on. Getting down to business. In this particular course, introductory logic, we will cover informal logic. We'll start with terms, with defining terms and relating them to one another, which is actually pretty fun. We'll go on to statements and understanding how we determine the truth value of statements. That's pretty useful. We'll also quickly get into categorical logic and the vast majority of time in this course will be spent in categorical logic working with categorical syllogisms and it's a blast to fit together all the pieces there. Finally, we'll end with informal fallacies, which will equip you to see when someone is trying to hoodwink you intellectually. In the course of intermediate logic, mastering propositional arguments, which follows this video course, we will cover propositional logic in all its grandeur. So, looking forward, you're going to enjoy this introductory logic course, or at least I'm going to enjoy it. There's nothing quite like feeling your mind get stronger and quicker with better reflexes as you look at how reasoning works. There's no assignment for the introduction, so we'll go straight on to lesson one.